Okay, welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I come from the acting background. And I'm Josh Knapp. I'm a broadcast engineer. Here we go. All right, today we're going to talk about two movies. Um, and uh, we're going to start off with a fairly new movie. It came out last year, but I had heard a little bit about it, and I did not see it in the, come out in the theaters, at least where I was living at the time. It's called The Double, and it's directed by Richard Ayoade, and it it was based on a Dostoevsky novella, like a short story, I guess, or something Yeah, who like knew that. he wrote short stories? I didn't know that. I guess he has books of collected stories oh, okay. that, that he's put put out there. So, um, and, the, and it stars Jesse Eisenberg, Mia Wasikowska, Wallace Shawn's in there. Yeah, who I love. Yeah. Yeah, he great. wrote a play that we did in college called um, Aunt Dan and Lemon. Strange play. Strange, mm-hmm. strange play. Yeah. It was, uh, you did two or three main stages in college and then you did graduate pieces. You had a graduate class that would direct or act in uh, pieces and mm-hmm. one of the graduate students picked Aunt Dan and Lemon written by Wallace Shawn. So that's how, that's my beginning to Wallace Shawn. And then, Wait, it wasn't no, Princess Bride? No. Oh, or wow. uh, My Dinner with Andre? No, yeah, none of I haven't seen that one. Oh, I need to see it, I know. Speaking of podcasts and just talking, it's just them talking at dinner the whole entire time. Yeah. Literally. That's yeah. cool though. Yeah, no, it's 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 really and it's all about the theater and it's really well done and extremely okay. well acted. But yeah, no, inconceivable. I have him on my <laughs> magnet. Yes, yeah, bad imitation, but you get the point. I have a magnet of him on my uh, refrigerator right behind you that oh, says cool. inconceivable. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's my introduction to Wallace Shawn. So uh and so he he has a fairly small part in this movie, but uh I'll just give a quick synopsis of it. Uh it's available on Netflix right now. It may even be available on on Amazon. Watch Instant also. Uh, A clerk in a government agency finds his unenviable life takes a turn for the horrific with the arrival of a new co-worker who is both his exact physical double and his opposite, confident, charismatic, and seductive with women. So, I mean, that's a a perfectly good explanation of it, but uh, I I think that Jesse Eisenberg was a good choice for the movie uh, because he, you don't, we haven't seen him play confident very much so he kind of fits into that you know sheepish uh role pretty easily but then once you start seeing his double playing confident you can kind of say all right uh that that makes me understand i can see that he can actually do a little bit more now i haven't seen he was in a couple other movies this past year and and he's supposed to be really good in uh in one of them that just came out on uh on Blu-ray and DVD. It was called. I'm looking it up now. Was is it on Redbox? Night moves. Night moves. That came out. Yeah. Who else out. is in that? Night moves has. Um, oh yeah, uh, um, Dakota Fanning. Okay. I was thinking Ellie Fanning, but yeah. it's Dakota Fanning and Peter Sarsgaard. Okay. So so yeah, and I don't know much or in, of anything about that movie, but anyway, so it seems like it was a fairly busy year for Jesse Eisenberg, and and this seems like a very, you know bare bones type of a movie. I mean, the way that, the way that it was, uh, shot, I'm not saying that set dressing or anything was bare bones, but like, it seems like a pretty independent movie, you know, like it didn't get, you know, huge release. Like I said, I mean, yeah, I never heard I didn't of see it. it in the theater. Yeah. I read a little bit about it. Um, but before or after it came out, Oh, but before it came out, yeah. like on slash film or, you know, uh, one of those, uh, pod or one of those, uh, uh, blogs, movie blogs and and they just kind of talked about you know what, what was coming up for him and and how it was Richard Ayoade I, the, the, who I don't know so yeah where I was introduced to him was a British show called the IT crowd um, where he plays one of a couple of uh, IT guys basically at, at a at a, uh, a firm or something I, I don't know I mean it doesn't really matter what the company does and you don't really necessarily know what the company does these guys are just two IT guys. Did you see? Um, yeah, you saw Bridesmaids. Yeah. So the the police officer in Bridesmaids, the yeah, what's highway his, patrolman, his name yeah. is Chris O'Dowd. I love him. He was the other one. Yeah. So I think it's on Netflix still. Netflix okay. Watch Instant, and and it's definitely it was a TV show. Yes, it's definitely British humor. You're and starting so, to bring yeah. back. I've seen a trailer for this. Okay. Yeah. I think they may have even tried to bring it over to the United States and even call it the IT crowd, but I don't think it ever got past the. Uh, the pilot phase. It wasn't with these guys. It was just you know one of those ported over things like like, like the Friends Office or the Office. Yeah, or, okay. Yeah, you know, 
well, Friends was coupling, I guess, but that started off well, as a British. Were they going to bring it over here as the same uh, cast and everything? Nope. No, okay. No, so they were just remaking it for like the, the United office. States. Yeah, okay. Like the okay. Office, yeah. I got it. So anyway, um, that's how where I saw him first. He'd also been in a couple of other uh, things. He'd worked with some uh, other kind of like sketch comedian type guys in, in their shows. Um, there's a group called the Mighty Boosh. And one and a couple of the guys from the Mighty Boosh were actually in IT Crowd. It's it's very they're very commingling. I mean, they all kind of work together on different yeah. It sort things. of works that way, kind of like Seth Rogen and then James Franco and that whole crew, and then Matt Damon and Ben, ben Affleck and that whole crew and Casey Affleck. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Um, it's not really what is it called? It's not nepotism, I guess. Friendshipism, whatever. Yeah, Why yeah. not? If it's you just keep it, it in the family, absolutely. Basically, yeah, keeping yeah. people fed, making having them have a job. I get it. Yeah. So this guy decides to direct this movie, The Double. It's his second movie. He directed another movie, but I mean, called Submarine, which I've heard is is really good. But I mean, we'll, we'll talk about The Double though. What, what did you think about it? Um, I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was worth watching. I thought. It's interesting how we've talked uh, recently about how we've crossed over seeing through each other's eyes on some kind of level, like you've seen a different depth in acting, Mm -hmm. and I've seen something, and maybe I've always seen it, but it seems to be more prominent. I thought it was beautiful the way that it was shot. There were a couple of, you could tell that the lighting was different than anything I've seen in a long time, if it at all i don't know i'm not sure if i have seen stuff like this there's a shot where he's in a stairwell mm-hmm. and the sh- the light is coming up from the bottom of the stairwell but it's not coming directly from the bottom it's kind of coming at an angle and it's a really stark white light just bright white light not mm-hmm. anything you would normally use it certainly doesn't you know make anybody look good it it shows every kind of flaw every kind of imperfection of being a human being which i like that kind of stuff realism mm-hmm. and i thought that the way that the lighting and the cinematography added to the mood of the movie mm-hmm. i thought that was great i think it's great what you mentioned about jesse eisenberg i have seen him sort of play suave and debonair um not so much cocky uh-huh. in that magic movie he oh, did oh now you see me yeah did yeah, you see that i did see that did you like it it was okay i, I enjoyed it part for me from for logical reasons but yeah well we have people in big bubbles floating through the theater, it's kind of like give yourself over to it type of thing, you know. Yeah, but it's, but I got yeah. what you're saying. In I enjoyed the CGI world. It's kind of like it, yeah. yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. I and he plays very confident and, but, in the Social Network, uh, referencing one of his. I guess earlier films now in his career, if you will, Mm -hmm. the one he was nominated for, he played confident in a weird way. It was like a backwards confidence. It was an antisocial. Yeah, it was an anti. Yeah, yeah. he knew what he was talking about. He didn't Mm -hmm. care what anybody else thought, but he was off putting as a human being. So it was interesting to watch him play the popular one in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you see The Squid and the Whale? Yes, I loved it. Okay. I loved it. And that's kind of like my baseline for. Jesse Eisenberg. Which is sort of kind of what he does. He's the quirky, introverted type of person. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 directed in a, di- a different way in Social Network. And then in Now You See Me, it's directed in a confident kind of way. Like he's the geeky, I hate the word geeky, but he's the nerdy magician. He sort of is in the same type. But it's interesting how diverse he can play that. And in Zombieland, he's completely a fish out of water who becomes... He becomes yeah survivalist. Yeah. So I thought his performance was outstanding. The performances were outstanding. I mm-hmm. thought all the acting was top notch. I saw it coming. I saw the big twist or the big twist, if it will, if well, the little twist, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did think about something. I don't know if you want to go right there. But what did you think? Because you had said you couldn't wait for me to see this movie. Yeah, and I think that you you've kind of brought it up. The, the look of this movie yeah, is beautiful. very like German expressionism. Yeah. It's that kind of like single points dark. of yeah. yeah so everything's dark pitch black except yeah. for whichever lights that are turned on in whatever room they're in and everything else is just like fr- from a video standpoint or from a, a picture standpoint or, like the blacks are really really deep and it's only lighting certain things or enough light to get you to see oh yeah that is that person or whatever i mean and even in the office scenes yeah you can't see into the other cubicles no. but you know it's there barely yeah, yeah. 
yeah. and just the 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 set uh, the production design of this movie is is very detailed, but it's very sparse. What did it yeah. remind you of, though? Uh, you know, I'm gonna say Brazil. Yeah, of course, in five seconds, I went, "Oh, I see this." Yeah, yeah. and I think, the but reason, I thought it was an yeah. ode to it without being a ripoff. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think that. Uh, uh, I was reading an article of t- today, actually, because you told me we were going to talk about it today, about uh, Richard Ayoade kind of t- uh, talking about people comparing it to Brazil. And he said he didn't necessarily see it. He ne- he's never seen the movie, and he purposefully didn't see the movie uh, because he didn't want that to, to in- influence him. But he did kind of know that this was going to be a, a possible... A, a possible uh, uh, Tri- not trigger, comparison. but a possible comparison, yeah. and so he didn't want to like subconsciously ode to th- Brazil. But I think the, the certain things are like the office scenes are definitely Brazil, like where this you know people don't know what they're doing, they don't know what their job is, and right. yet they are doing their job somehow, and people are you know being promoted and and people are getting forgotten and and the boss is exactly the same the boss doesn't really know much of anything and and and, uh, and the technology that they're using looks advanced but prehistoric but at the it's same very time prehistoric yeah. because i mean they obviously have a xerox machine yeah. which yeah. is where mia Voskovska works and then the 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 key for me or the the tip off for me of, of like uh, you know strap in is it close to the beginning of the movie he goes to make a, a copy in his you know local xerox machine or local copier machine and he has to change it from two copies to one and it's a a, a knife switch yeah. basically yeah yeah i mean it is like very old timey switches that you would find in 1920s like an electronics old elevator. yeah like an yeah. old elevator i mean it is it is very uh very basic and so that really you know excited me and the keyboard if you look at the keyboards that yeah. they're using they're just like it looks like a piece of paper pretty much like yeah. i mean like a little like cardboard box or something yeah and so it's just did you notice when he went to go to get a copy from her mm-hmm. that the copy machine was about a half an inch separate from the bottom to the top did you mm-hmm. notice that like it the, it didn't seal when they went to make a copy yeah that there was that um there was a gap, gap yeah. and i thought that was interesting because somebody thought that up somebody mm-hmm. took the time to go we're making a social statement on uh, what we do in these offices, a copy. We're going to make it look like a copy machine mm-hmm. with the light going across it, but they yeah. left just enough of that gap to make it just a little bit left of center, enough for you to go, oh, let me focus in on that. Oh, he's getting one copy. One copy. He's getting in trouble for getting one copy. This is It's a statement about the corporate world mm-hmm. without having to pontificate about how bad corporations are. You know, you just, yeah. you show these small little things and you either get it or you don't. And I don't think mm-hmm. that the, the director ever tries to talk down to you or say, if you don't get this, you don't get my movie, that kind of stuff. But just that little gap, I thought, oh, that's clever because it, it it elicits a feeling in you about i'm glad i don't work in an office me personally <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i'm glad i'm not a copy maker person mm-hmm. i'm glad i don't have this life but it also gives you it, it gives you a character development without a character having to say i was this when i was a kid and i was this when i was a kid and Bob, you know you get that from just those subtle things the mm-hmm. way that the alleyway looks or the way that the the lighting of all the other houses look when he's looking through kind of the rear window thing Mm -hmm. because he looks through a telescope at night to the other building who happens to have the girl yeah Mm -hmm. that he's interested in so forth and so on so yeah yeah. those small little things i loved yeah and i watched a little bit of the end because because i do want to talk about the end with you i guess but uh because i wanted to refresh myself on, on the end and there are some shots he's looking across the across the way and then he ends up looking down yeah and it, it those types of shots are very brazil i mean there's an exact shot of something like that where you look down and everything's dark except for light coming out of a doorway coming out in kind of like an arc yeah type of a thing and you see somebody come out the doorway i mean that that is definitely right out of brazil even though it's not like he you know i'm not saying he copied well, it but nothing made me feel like he was trying to imitate mm-hmm. or trying to it just came out of his his idea of how to film this movie mm-hmm. and it's completely 
uh, genuine to his style. It just yeah. happens to have been done before and done on the the scale that Terry Gilliam has done it on. Mm-hmm. That's it's just a happenstance, you know. Yeah. It's not you can tell it's not a rip off. You know when Quentin T- Quentin Tarantino does it, he does it. It's a ripoff, but he knows he's ripping them off, but he's also paying homage to it at the same time, mm-hmm. and he has a way of being able to do that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people can't do that. I think that's the yeah. power of Tarantino. I think Tarantino, he's the smartest guy in the room when it comes to movies. Totally. And you can't you can't deny that. Not and at all. So when you're saying when you're trying to catch him, uh, you know, ripping Cheating, somebody off. Yeah. He's, he's like, like, Yeah, I did. Totally. Oh, yeah, of course I've seen that movie. Yes, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. And he'd be like, Okay, the corner shot came from this movie, the blood red uh stain come from this movie, the idea of this blouse came from this movie. He would ha- everything. Yeah. So bow down. But this the this director, I don't think even if he purposefully tried to imitate Brazil. It never comes across that way. Mm-mm. It just looks really interesting as a movie. But it, it does feel like a lived in world. Totally. And and that's what I love about Brazil. That what's well, one of the things I love about Brazil. And it's what I, I love about this movie. And so for for me, I mean the the acting's good and the story is interesting. Um I mean it holds my attention uh as far as how things escalate between the the two Jesse Eisenberg characters and their names are even switched. It's like Simon James and yeah. James Simon. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you have to, you definitely have to check your, you know, suspension of disbelief. You have to check your disbelief at the door, I guess I should say. So you, you, you have to, to suspend your disbelief. That's what you have yeah. to do. I was trying to turn the phrase a little bit differently. It didn't work out. It's okay. I had to call an audible in the middle. So... <laughs> That's okay. So, uh, yeah. So you definitely have to suspend your disbelief because of the the certain events that happen in, in the movie. But, but it 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 didn't bother me because I was able to do that right off the bat. So let's talk about the ending because I I actually talked myself out of an opinion I had of it by thinking of it in a different way. It just dawned on me like a day later. I was like, oh wait, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So what what did you want to bring up about the ending? Well, first of all, I mean, I think that, that if you haven't seen the movie, it's fairly accessible, so you should probably see the movie. So after, you know, after you've seen the movie, you can listen to us talk about this, so there's going to be spoilers for the double right now. So, um, Well, let me ask you this. Do you really think that... And, I, I, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back or anything, but didn't you see it coming? Didn't you see, foresee, I mean, we've all seen Fight Club. We've all sure. seen this role reversal thing before. So mm-hmm. it's really not a spoiler because if you don't really see it coming, mm-hmm. I, I would have liked to have been a person who didn't see that coming. Well, I didn't know how it was going to happen, but but once you start seeing uh, how encroaching the the confident yeah, double uh, is in, in this guy's life, he starts to stick up for himself, and once he starts to stick up for himself, you know that he's going to figure out some way to get rid of the devil, you know, and 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 take over his life again. So, uh, so, so, yeah. I mean, as far as I mean, you have to believe that it's real in that world, which I do believe that the whole thing is real in that world, and that when one guy cuts himself, the other guy gets cut and, you know, you can move on from there. And he's just, I mean, he's smart. Obviously he's smart in his job. And so he figured out, once he figured out that if he can hurt himself, he can hurt the double, then he figured out a way to. So you think there was two people? Yes. Okay. I thought at first that was true too, but then I started to slowly judge the movie as a tad bit pretentious for going, okay, there really is a double weight. No, no, no. Then I realized there's not a double. It's the same guy. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. But I thought at first the quiet Jesse Eisenberg, Mm -hmm. is it Simon James? Uh, Simon is the quiet Quiet one. one. James is... Simon says, I just got that too. Um, I thought that that was the real guy and the other guy was his imagined personality, the outgoing Mm -hmm. one. The outgoing one is his imagined, is his real personality and the quiet one is his insecurity. So when he cuts himself and when he cuts um, himself and the other guy bleeds, Mm -hmm. he's really cutting himself. It's the same guy. Mm -hmm. All of the, all of the quiet, introverted Simon James character is inside the confident James Simon character's head. Okay. So when he's being congratulated at his boss's um, 
for taking credit for what the silent one does. The report. Right, yeah. and the silent one gets upset. Mm-hmm. That's all in his head. It's a fight club situation. There's only one Simon James or James Simon. The confident one is, is the real one. Is the real one, and the other guy is his insecurity. You know how when you do something really well, there's something in the back of your mind that said, "Oh, I could have done that a little bit better," or "Oh, I really did. I, I happened upon that." People give me credit for it, or mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. With broadcast engineering, you know, plug something in, and people are like, "Thank you for fixing it." You're like, "I just plugged it in." You know, mm-hmm. it's not that big of a deal. You kind of. Um, underscore what you do as a human being. And then if you have real insecurities, you can come across as confident. I might be speaking from knowledge of this being me a little bit. Yeah. Um, But you have an outgoing personality because you're really insecure on the inside. So I thought the outgoing personality guy is the real guy Mm -hmm. and that inside his mind, he's saying to himself, he really doesn't deserve the credit for thinking that up really didn't. I do. I don't really deserve the girl. I'm not that confident with the girl because she goes, she only goes out with the one who he, she thinks is cheating on him. That's right. Right. She goes out with the confident one. So explain me the ending. If there's two, Oh, uh, well, first of all, I mean, if, if we, if we, I would say if there was only one, then we should have start like a real one, then we should have started with the one that's real, which in the movie, we start with the one that's not confident. But that's what I thought was interesting about it. It mm-hmm. was a switch on what we would have traditionally done in this type of movie or mm-hmm. seen in this type of movie. Yeah. I mean, so, so for me, I feel like I, I understood it a little bit more if I, if I just assumed that there were two two actual people and that they were exactly the same and then they were tied together, you know, metaphysically, where one cuts themselves and the other one gets gets hurt, so but because you're there are multiple interactions with multiple with, with both of them in a room and other people, so so that made me think that that there were actually two people. But so I, why does only one of them die at the end then? Oh, because the other one gets saved by the by the uh, ambulance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. He calls he calls the ambulance before he even jumps, and right. so by the time he jumps, the ambulance is basically there. And and I watched the end of this today because I was wanting to keep it fresh in my mind. And so uh, he calls the ambulance, and then Mia Voskov comes down, and she kind of like you know sits there with him, and the ambulance picks him up and takes him in while the other guy bleeds out like he hits his head and bleeds out. Yeah, but okay. Right. The Simon insecure one. Uh, Insecure one gets saved by the ambulance. Right. And secure and secure. The the confident one, he is chained to the bed and he can't get away. Okay. Then why, if it's two different people, does nobody acknowledge the fact that they look exactly alike but act completely different? He even says that at one point. Look, mm-hmm. he looks just like me. He's got my face. He's got this. He's mm-hmm. got that. I think it's a metaphor for how people act in the corporate world or in the business world or the world of working, mm-hmm. the employment world, where you act like one person, but you're really another person inside. Mm-hmm. And you're confident with your girlfriend, but you're really insecure on the inside. That's why you cheat. That's why you do all these uh, mm-hmm. lecherous things that he does. So... How come nobody acknowledges? How come she doesn't say, wow, you really look a lot like him. Why don't I just go out with you? You're a nice guy. I think a lot lot of it has to do possibly with he doesn't make himself known. He doesn't command a room. He can be in a room and you would not even know he's there. But she's sleeping with him. The confident Simon. She's sleeping with the confident one, yes. Right, so Mm -hmm. how can she, once she meets up with the insecure guy, she doesn't say, you look just like my boyfriend? But what I think a lot of people, I think that's that may be a statement that the, that the writer and director and everybody's trying to make is that, is that if somebody's not confident enough to even like make themselves known to people, then people aren't going to notice them. I mean, you could pass by, I mean, in New York City, people walk past, you know, homeless people all day, don't even notice them. And, and so it, it's, one of those things where if you're not made, if you don't make yourself known, then people won't spend the time to to pay attention to you at all. Um, and uh, so I think that that may be kind of what they were possibly talking about is that is that this guy is so kind of like away and hidden. He hides himself away from everyone. They don't even know what he looks like or what his name is or 
whatever. I mean, th- that kind of plays out with the guard at the at the front as he walks into the yeah. Uh, but the that building. guy you would expect would never really looks up at anybody. Just looks at their badges. You could mm-hmm. say two twins could pass that guy, and he would never notice the difference. Mm-hmm. But somebody as intimate as his girlfriend or his boss who sees him every day see that's why i think it's Mm -hmm. deeper than it's two separate people i think with all due respect i think that's the obvious answer to the question Mm -hmm. i think it makes it well at least for me it made it more intriguing to think that it was the same person even though we've seen that trick before Mm -hmm. um but to see it from the insecure person's point of view because usually you're seeing things from the confident uh, point of view or you're not you don't you don't see the confident person's mindset as having insecurity inside. You have insecure people who act over the top and act overconfident because they're trying to hide their insecurity, but the opposite isn't true. Mm -hmm. So why, if they were, um, then why make them look exactly alike? I Mm -hmm. don't get why, what? Yeah, I see what you're saying. There there could have been a better way to do that. Somebody who, you know, was similar. Yeah, it didn't matter that they, it wouldn't matter that they um, looked alike. So, you know, that was, that, for me, it it made the movie better and more intriguing to Mm -hmm. think that, to think, yeah, oh, wait, no, 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 no. The confident, cocky guy is the real guy, and that's his insecurity talking to him. Mm -hmm. It's much more interesting to think your insecurity's in the corner yelling at you while your boss is congratulating you because you really don't think, you know, what's self-worth? It was about self-worth for me. Did he think he was worthy of all this praise and this beautiful girl and this girl who really liked him mm-hmm. and all this stuff? Or was he worth jumping out the window? You know, mm-hmm. I thought it was I, I thought it was deeper than that. Anyway, so there so, you go. So do you think he jumped out the window at the end and that's what divorced him from the cockier I think his mind, if, if we're believing in the fact that there were not two people and that one was an imaginary friend, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, a Tyler Durden, yeah. um, for lack of a better term, then all of that was imaginary anyway. So did he really jump? No. Did he really get saved? No. But that was the way that he separated that part of his personality that he didn't really like. Like he liked the insecure guy. He liked how nice he was and he was a good guy. And, you know, even though he's sort of tad bit, you know, he was voyeuristic and, you know, peeping Tomish, if you will. I was gonna he say, was sorting through a trash. Yeah. Well, which was kind of clever, what he was collecting, too, and that he collected yeah. that. That, was, that mm-hmm. was clever. That was an interesting way to show intimacy between two people. But, yeah, because he says, I'm not doing anything wrong when she catches him. Mm-hmm. He, she has no idea she, he's searching through her trash. Yeah. But he immediately is guilty. So I think it was his way of getting rid of that over-the-top personality guy that he really didn't like. He really liked somewhere in between. He liked the nice guy who was humble and you know did his job and did it well, didn't need to have praise, all that other stuff. So how do you get rid of it? Just like at the end of Fight Club. Maybe I'm too influenced by that, you know, mm-hmm. and thinking, you know, when Edward Norton goes, if you know I know. He says yeah. that to Brad Pitt. And then he puts the gun, you know, to his mouth. Mm-hmm. And then he takes care of the situation by getting rid of Tyler Durden that way. Yep. It's sort of the same thing. If I jump like I saw the guy in the uh, beginning of the movie, Jesse Eisenberg sees a guy jump mm-hmm. off the building, which was very well done how all of a sudden he looked up and there, there was the guy. Yeah. And you're thinking, what is this guy doing on the ledge? And you're thinking the guy's pointing at Jesse Eisenberg going, you peeping Tom freak. And yeah. then all of a sudden he jumps. But he just leans forward and jumps. I mean, he mm-hmm. just kind of straight jumps. Doesn't, you know, you have no idea it's coming. And mm-hmm. you're like, whoa, wait, what's going on here? So I think in his mind's eye that he thought, this is how I get rid of this over-the-top personality, and mm-hmm. I'll go off in the ambulance, the imaginary world I've created, and I'll recover, and mm-hmm. I'll now no longer have that obnoxious personality trait, or I will work on getting complete, it's completely dead because mm-hmm. it's jumped out of a window mm-hmm. because why why else would that over the top really loved guy jump out the window why why did he do that because he's trying to kill the other guy he's trying to i mean in in the in the two person world right he's trying to kill and remove the the other so up to that point guy. everything worked when you cut yourself it cut the other person yes. when you stabbed yourself it stabbed the other person when you hurt you know okay mm-hmm. so in logic that would have worked if he had jumped out the window he should have lived the other guy should have died but that's not what happened you're okay. saying that the the nice conf, or the over overly confident one 
James Simon, jumps out the window thinking no. No, no it's the it's the guy who uh the guy who is, um, I mean, unless I'm getting this wrong, but I believe it's the guy who's actually the, the guy from the very beginning of the movie. He cuts himself in the face. Right. Which wakes up the, the co- overly confident guy who's chained to the bed. And then he wakes up, wakes up, and then he gets up, looks out the window, and sees Simon James, the, the sheepish guy, on the ledge. And then he sees Simon James jump down. Simon James hits the ground, and then you see like the next scene is the ambulance coming, and then the uh, the James Simon, the confident guy, he's laying on the floor. Okay, and there's blood coming out of his head. So I'm thinking he killed that part of his personality because he didn't like that over the top guy. He wanted to be mm-hmm. more of the meek, mild. Anyway, enough said about it. <laughs> I, I'm now gonna have to watch it again. Yeah, I, well, you know I, what? That's a that's the sign I'm, of a good movie. <laughs> we've gonna ha- we're, I'm gonna have to read about it more. I'm gonna have to read blogs about it and see what people's interpretations of it. Because I I didn't read any reviews or anything mm-hmm. like that. Because when it dawned on me, I was like, oh, that's clever. Because mm-hmm. usually it's the reverse. But anyway, yeah. so there we go. Yeah, I mean... I, so if you want to be as confused as us, watch this movie. Oh, yeah, <laughs> wow. You gave me more than I can handle to, to think about with that. Because, I, yeah... I it wasn't. always happens to me. Yeah. Sometimes people are like, dude, you might need to take meds for that. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't help it when I see a movie that's clever and unique. In a way, it's a, it's a compliment. Yeah. I'm confused, which most people would take as a cut down, but it's not. It's I'm I want to know more. I want to know what did the director want us to see? You know, I believe in I, uh, art is in the eye of the beholder. I believe that. So he could have wanted us to see what we saw from it. So that's what I saw. Yeah. Wow. That's great. All right. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, another movie that just came out last month, I think. It came yeah. out in October. Yeah. Uh, but it, it finally got here a couple weeks ago. Uh, and it's called Whiplash, and I was really excited for this movie. Um, it's uh, a movie directed and written by Damien Chazelle, and it stars Miles Teller, J.K. Simmons, and I mean those are those and Paul Reiser. What's the young lady's name? The young her, her name. She's in two scenes. Her name is Michelle Ben Benoist. Okay, Benoist. She's on Glee. She huh. took over for okay. The, no, I'm sorry, Melissa. Is that her name? Melissa. Ben, I did. I think I said Michelle. Okay, but it's Melissa. Yeah. She. Uh, they had the original cast. They all mm-hmm. grew up, moved out of high school, and moved to New York. So what were they going to do on Glee? It's about a yeah. high school Glee club. Well, in walks her and a couple other people, and you know, Lee Michelle's a huge star now because of that show. And she, I saw her on Broadway, by the way. Oh, cool! In Spring Awakenings. Uh amazing dude she took the stage and she opened her mouth and i was like what <laughs> that's what broadway's about but anyway so this young lady mm-hmm. um michelle you said her name is mm-hmm. she nope, con- it's melissa melissa damn <laughs> sorry again. sorry, <laughs> sorry no, melissa me. <laughs> sorry melissa out there wherever you are um she's a standout mm-hmm. um and she had the the big shoes to fill to be the new ingenue on glee and i thought she i mean i'm a huge fan of that show mm-hmm. every once in a while it's on so i'll watch it and it's a little much for me it's a little too musical mm-hmm. for me everything's a song now it used to be a little a little bit more clever in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, they had a pot smoking, pot dealing teacher who got arrested. I mean, it was much more intricate. Yeah. That and, was Stephen Tobolowsky. Yeah, actually. yeah, who was great. He's yeah. great. <laughs> um, and the song seemed to be more purposeful. Anyway, the long and the short of it is, is she's a standout and she's a standout in this too, even mm-hmm. though she's in two or three scenes. Yeah. So I'll just give a quick synopsis of it. A promising young drummer enrolls in a cutthroat music conservatory where his dreams of greatness are mentored by an instructor who will stop at nothing to realize a student's potential. So Miles Teller plays the student, J.K. Simmons plays the teacher, and um, I I knew about this pretty early on. It was one of those Sundance movies that got a lot of buzz, Um, and then I read a little bit more about it, and it had a very early beginning. I mean, multiple years ago, this script was written by Damien Chazelle, and it was a blacklist script. Have you heard of the blacklist? No. So it's a uh, a group of development executives get together and they vote on the best unmade scripts of the year. Okay. So it was a blacklist script from a couple years ago. So why is it called blacklist? Oh, it's it's not blacklist. Is in like these will never get made, but it's it's just basically like 
these scripts didn't get made, and uh, and I guess I don't really know the etymology of That's it. That's a so. terrible term, though, because of the whole connotation to the blacklisting in Hollywood. You yeah. know, during, oh, the yeah, McCarthy during the McCarthy era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that it's supposed to be kind of like a, kind of like a these movies or, or you know these scripts are really good but nobody's picked them right, up right they're in the dark they're in the black yet. yeah i get it i was it. just going to give a couple of examples juno wolf of wall street slumdog millionaire kings of summer what yeah all these movies were written and out in the ether for a year or so i mean at least a year because it went a whole year and the scripts didn't get picked up or didn't get put into production. And then so whatever, the next year, a couple of years later, whatever, they got they got picked up and, and made finally. Do you so. know that there's a whole business of having people read scripts and picking out what they think is the best and sending that on to the next level and then those people read them oh, yeah. and then they send them. I knew somebody who did that for a living. That's cool. Yeah, kind of. Because when it's you scary, read some of the scripts, you're like, geez, Louise. It's like watching every movie ever made to see what's the Academy Award mm-hmm. possible nominations. It's, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Get tiring, yeah, yeah, it's got to get, yeah. Um, but so what they ended up doing is uh, it was this, this script was on the blacklist. So Damien Chazelle, I guess, somehow got, got a hold of Jason Reitman. And this other guy, Jason Bloom, who uh, has he's produced a lot of the Paranormal Activity and Insidious movies. Yeah, he's he's probably produced. made a lot of money, yeah, too. Yeah, and The Purge and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. And so both of these guys kind of heard about it. So they gave him enough money, like out of pocket, gave him enough money to do like a 10-minute short. And they also, because of Jason Reitman, he gave the script to J.K. Simmons. Oh, smart. So, oh right, yeah, well they're all interconnected. They're all interconnected. Yeah, Juno, yeah, oh yeah, Every, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. From Juno on, yeah. I mean, oh no, J.K. Simmons was in uh, Thank You for Smoking, wasn't he? Yep, and he was in, um, in Up in the Air and Labor Day and Labor Day. Yeah, he's been in. Even all though of he's them. like in one scene in both of those two movies, yep. he's significant in both. The, well, he's significant. <laughs> Period. On screen, period. Okay, so let's go back to the director really quick. I don't know anything about this guy. Is this his first movie? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know if he's written other other movies, but... But this is his first directing? Uh, yeah, so the first... Good for him. The first thing that he uh, wrote was like a short, I think, and then he's directed, uh, yeah, this short called Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. So uh, that was probably just a... But this is his first... Thing. Feature first right writing feature and first directing feature. Yes. Well, congratulations because yeah. it's a good one. Yeah, I mean he he definitely knocked it out of the park. I think I was going to use the same analogy, but oh, I stopped. Really? Yeah, oh. trying to use different things tonight, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, but anyway, so back to the Jason Reitman thing. They gave him a bunch of not a bunch of money. They gave him some money to make this this movie or this uh, short, like a 10 minute short. And then they submitted it to Sundance. Now, Miles Teller was not in the short, although J.K. Simmons was. Interesting. And so I, I watched a small clip from that a couple days ago. And, uh, and it was, I mean, the script is the same. It's basically the same. In the clip, it, they basically took a portion of the, uh, the first studio band rehearsal where it's basically the, it I see basically a lot tonight I guess I yeah what are you gonna do the top band in in this school in this conservatory J.K. Simmons is the is the director of the band and it's the first time that we see them do a a, a rehearsal and so there's a lot of stuff that goes on during that so that's what the short was they put it to Sundance it won the special jury prize for shorts. Or something like that, I think. Oh, it's won the special jury prize this year, actually, for the feature. But anyway, it won a, a prize for the short, and it got, you know, was able to be produced. It got the, the funding to be produced as a feature-length film after that. So after Sundance, it's first time. So. As well it should have. Yeah, I mean, and I think Have you ever like, seen, sorry to interrupt, okay. have you ever seen um, the short that was, uh, that turned into Sling Blade? No, because I that's didn't. why Billy Bob Thor- Thornton won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, mm. because he adapted his short film. His short film was called, um, some people call it a Kaiser Blade. Mm. And it was Molly Ringwald was the girl who was interviewing him. And it was the very first interaction between, do you remember in Sling Blade? She, I haven't seen Sling Blade. Oh, my. Okay. There we go. We should stop there right now go. and say, podcast, go to Facebook. We love you. See you next week. And make <laughs> you go watch uh, Sling Blade right now. Dude, you've got to see that okay. movie. It's 
okay. Anyway, so it's a short film mm -hmm. at first, and it's very interesting to watch where got, you can feel the same tones and textures and attitudes mm -hmm. that come from the short that get transposed into the feature. Is that the same way with this one? Mm -hmm. um, in the short, I saw two minutes of it. Okay, so, so you haven't seen the whole thing. Th the scene was exactly the same to the point where the same actor played. It, there's a scene where he dismisses a trombone player. Right. The trombone player is the same actor. Oh, yeah. I feel yeah. bad for that guy. I know. <laughs> oh, so it's the, it, are you the out-of-tune guy? Yes. Oh, that's a good scene. That's a great scene. Yeah, that's a good scene. It's a great scene. And I, I think it goes on past that, but... Uh, there's a scene that it's in the trailer and, and it's the same scene where he throws the chair yeah. at the drummer. Um, and, and yeah, I think that was in the short also. Other than really kind of the ending, there's really not a spoiler. There's nothing you could talk no. about. You could talk about this movie five ways to Monday and mm -hmm. still not give away anything of importance or the yeah. emotional integrity and that kind of stuff. But I think that even if you don't, like the, the big, biggest thing I would love for people to take away is that if you, even if you do not like jazz music, if you are interested in interpersonal reactions and just relationships, family, this is this is a movie to, and you're willing to sit and squirm a little bit. I think then, a little. Then yeah. <laughs> this is a movie to watch. It's a bit underused there, but okay. It's, it's an emotional. It is an emotional ride, I think, but it's not like an. It's not like an up and down ride. It's a very kind of like it. You just you get tense. Well, I disconnected in the first five minutes of J.K. Simmons' interaction with Miles Teller. I disconnected emotionally. I, oh. I, I physically felt myself say disconnect because I wanted to stand away from it because I, I live things when I see him, I just mm -hmm. do. And I did not want to live what he was going to go through because I already knew. I already knew. I knew the intensity that J.K. Simmons was going to bring, which he always does bring on so many different levels. And I disconnected, but I think it was smart. I, I saved myself in a way from, usually, you know, I, I'm not afraid to to cry or to feel or to laugh or to scream or to whatever it may be as, as deeply as I feel it. But for whatever reason, I think I protected myself and just separated. It didn't mean that I didn't absorb the film like I normally did. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, they say when a traumatic thing happens, you can separate yourself. Um, and that's split personality, basically. And I know it's not that deep, and but it's just, a, a, it's not that metaphysical, if you mm -hmm. will. It's just a movie. But I, I felt myself go, I even had the thought, okay, wait, slow down, take yourself out of this, Paul slow down mm -hmm. because I knew what it was going to be. And I'm glad that I did because I don't think I could have lived through um, Miles Teller's eyes at that point because it's intense. Yeah. It's brutal. It is intense. And and you don't, like, I, I've i not, not necessarily been around people who were so singularly focused. I mean, I've, I was in jazz band in high school and in college and but and I was around, you know, music majors, and I've known some art majors and stuff like that. But when when you're into a something that you can completely pour yourself into, I mean, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the a, a close, the closest I've gotten to something like that, you know, from a day to day basis, is is my wife Stephanie. She's a radiologist, uh, and she's been living that for at least the last four years. And so there's certain things where like she won't even know what's going on in the news unless I tell her. So, right. Because she's so in it, you know, and so... Yeah, I've um, never had anything like that either. I've been very focused on things. Mm -hmm. I, I call it black swanning it now because yeah. black swan is a good example of trying to find perfection in art, and I believe that that's what this movie's about oh, too. Definitely. Um, but really quick, back to your point about even if you're not into jazz music, uh, music, I don't think we really need to say that because that's like saying if you're not into football, you can't like this sports movie. If a movie is good, the subject matter transcends all... That's what I was saying. Yeah, I, okay. yeah but, okay. I, but you were saying, it, it kind of sounded like you like were saying... It was like a caveat. Yeah, even yeah. if you don't like jazz, you will still like this movie, but mm -hmm. you don't really need to say that because the movie does... He puts you in the world, so even if you're you never listen to another piece of jazz in your life. You understand why they're obsessed with it in the world that they're obsessed in. Yep. D does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that they do a good job. I mean, coming from, you know, having 
some of a ba- somewhat of a background in music and being in a jazz band and playing charts similar to that, I know what they're trying to get across. So like, you know, there there's multiple scenes where he's trying to play this double time swing and it's it's the easiest way to get across that it's something that's physically taxing and difficult. It's not that he's trying to play as fast as he can. It's it's that he's trying to play as fast as he can, as accurate as he can. Right. And so that's the difficult part to get across, you know, from a from from a filmmaker standpoint. From a non from a non musical person, I got yeah. that. See, I, to- and, and that's I totally got that. And that's perfect. So, so Well, let me ask you this based on that. Sorry to keep interrupting, no. but I'm curious because you are a drummer. Could you hear the differences in when he said, not my tempo or too slow, too fast? Could you hear it? Some of them, some of them you can, but that scene, some of the drumming sounded way off to begin with. Right. He would just start off and it would just sound like right. junk. I mean, right. it would sound really bad. And that's the hard part with drums, period on film or TV or whatever, a music video even. I mean, you it's hard to get the drums to look and sound perfectly. Um, when they would bust into the perfect, you know, double time swing, that was overdubbed. That right. wasn't actually okay. being played yeah, of course. on camera. Yeah, well, there's nothing like a drummer live. Yeah. A live band with a great drummer, there's nothing like it. And you will never get that. That's why I'm like, if you haven't been to concerts or haven't seen a lot of live music, you've got to. Because you can listen to the album, you can hear a live recording of it, you can see the video, you can experience it on all levels. But when that drummer hits that bass drum live in an arena, there's nothing like it in the world. It goes through you from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. So I, I love music. We've mm-hmm. talked about music off oh, yeah. podcast a lot. Um, the, I've been lucky to be blessed in to almost four generations of music now at this point. So, or four decades, if you will, of, 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 of a diverse amount of music. And I like a little bit of a lot of things and a lot of one thing. Um, but so I can appreciate the music loving part of the film, the obsession part, which you were just talking about Mm -hmm. that I've never been that focused on anything. I mean, I get focused. Like if I have to do a monologue or if I have to do a play, I can get focused for those two hours Mm -hmm. or, and I am obsessed with it, Yeah, but but not to the point where I'm bleeding or I allow somebody to smack me in the face. You're a well-rounded individual though. Uh, Okay. That's a good way to put it. Because, because that is ultimately what, what this movie explores. I think it explores, and, and they even say it in the movie. I mean, there, there's a line that says, is there, is there a limit, you know? Yeah, he to says how that. much you can push another person. Yeah, the, the Miles Teller, the drummer, asks that to the, the teacher. Is there a limit to how much that you can push someone to, to achieve and to excel? And he says no. <laughs> yeah, no, because the person who does excel... Like, will not be deterred. Will not, yeah, will not give up. And I'm not so sure I fall into that camp. I see. I don't see that side of the equation. Yeah, but you're. He's looking at it from his point of view, and you're looking at it from your point of view. So, Absolutely. Yeah, like I think there is a point uh, where obsession mm-hmm. and borderline mental illness comes into place when you're sure. so focused on something that you forget to eat. I mean, I've been focused on things. Uh, you know, I do that big Halloween thing in my front yard. I get focused on that. I forget what time it is. I forget to. Mm-hmm. eat. And I, I'm not feeling well. All of a sudden, I'm like, "Oh, I haven't slept, and I haven't eaten. Duh, you know, I haven't even gone to the bathroom." So I get that, but this is so that what Miles Teller goes through, I can understand on some minute level. But what is it that J.K. Simmons' character? What is his motivation for being the way that he is? First of all, he's the most malicious, sadistic, abusive, violent character I've seen in a movie in a long time. When you cross, Anton Chigurh. I um, mean, he he was. Yeah, that's actually a good. But uh, but the Anton Chigurh was emotionless, and J.K. Simmons. It, I mean, it, it, that. Fletcher character is filled with emotion. Absolutely. So when you physically 
alter my existence to try to get me to learn something, I'm done. I would have walked right then and there. And I thought it Did was... Did you know that, that those slaps were real? You can the tell their slaps, those slaps are real. Thus, the reason I said I disconnected from it at the beginning, because mm-hmm. I would have felt that. And I'm not, I know that sounds a bit pretentious, but I would have. And I'm glad I didn't, because physical abuse in me, it's just, it never... I, I, it's just something about it. It's, I mean, obviously it's wrong on so many levels, but mm-hmm. there's something about physically touching somebody to make a point in an abusive way violently that is just so inherently wrong. And if there is living hell, that person is representing living hell. I know that's dramatic. I know that's mm-hmm. way over the top, but you touch me to make a point and I don't want you to touch me. Um, I no, I'm done. So what is it about J.K. Simmons' character that he's so involved in getting this student, and he's a teacher, if you will, or a mm-hmm. conductor, or a leader, because he says he's not a teacher. He says that, even though he is, because mm-hmm. it's, it's conservatory. What is it that he crosses that line and thinks it's okay to slap a 20-something-year-old kid to get him in the first interaction they have? In the first rehearsal they have, what, what is it about J.K. Simmons' character that makes him say, be there at 6 o'clock, but really rehearsal didn't start until 9? Yeah. That I get it's, to a degree. It's testing. It's, and, yeah. And yeah, and it's, it's hazing and it's Absolutely, all of that. which I think is totally wrong, but okay, I get that. Mm-hmm. So what do you think it is? What made J.K. Simmons' character think that that was okay? The love of the the music. I, I think that he and and this is the this is the big question that I've had about this movie is is he effectively doing this not only he he's doing this completely selflessly that that is a that is a hypothesis and that is up for debate but thinking looking at it from his from. Fletcher's standpoint, from the J.K. Simmons role standpoint, this is a selfless act. He is putting this 19-year-old kid through this right off the bat. He's a first year. Yes. He, this is his first, I mean, he's only been in Second school for year. a little while. No, he's no, a first, first year, year? Okay. I think. Um, I don't know why he's 19, but I mean, he may be a few, he may be a few months into the, the curriculum or something. I don't know, but but I, I believe he is a first. The first scene, I think he says he's a first year. Is but, he? Yeah. But but anyway, so so J.K. Simmons is doing this to test him very quickly and determine whether he's going to cut it or not. And he and he ramps it up. He he brings in other people to. So so his initial reaction is to you know allow him into this band and then immediately test him. So so before he even sees him play with the band he gives him a nice little pep talk and gets gets ammunition yeah you're here for a reason yeah. be confident go he's, in there and have a good time and exactly he's, but he's, before that he's asking about his mom and his dad right and, and he's all manipulating the situation and he's getting that ammunition he's like the king of manipulation yeah okay so i get all that so then he, that then, all makes psychological sense to yeah. me i'm not saying i would ever want to treat another human being like that but that makes sense yeah. building them up tear him down build, build him up one, and he goes yeah, back and I forth get all that. movie but to slap somebody in the face and what two or three times yeah uh, but like you said you would have been out first time first slap you would have gotten up and walked out I, I probably would have had a physical reaction back to him not well, at but, not at my age now at that sure. age I would have shoved that drumstick probably through his eyeball I know that sounds crazy over the top but no way at 19 would anybody have ever done that to me yeah. never because it makes no sense no, you're everything right. that he does makes sense to a degree you're right one step up two steps back but build up build down competition be the best mm-hmm. s- uh, persevere take whatever you can take but, but I don't it's know probably a similar thing with um, I mean anything else I mean whether you're talking about professional sports or or professional be, being a professional musician it's kind of like a gateway uh or, or even acting you know it's like you know you gotta you know you, you'll have the part if you 
Okay, you know, the, the you know it's funny that you just whatever. Yeah, you know? it's funny you just said that because I was just sitting there thinking to myself, if I was in a scene, you know, in my imaginary world of greatness, that Martin Scorsese was directing and Martin Scorsese was trying to get something out of me and he started slapping me, I probably would sit there and let him do it. Because he's Martin Scorsese. Because I want what he's getting out of me. I just put it together. There you go. Okay, okay. It's horrible what he does. Yep. I'm not approving it. And that's why Miles Teller sits there. But you know what? It's kind of making me a little emotional now because I would sit there. I would sit there and let Martin Scorsese slap me like that to To be... To elicit what he wants. I totally would do it. That's... I just tapped into something I didn't know was in my personality. It's kind of making me a little little sad, you know? I'm like, damn, I would totally sit there. I would sit there for quite a few people too. There's a list. Mm-hmm. You know, who would I allow slap me to get to me, get me to a point of being as great as somebody in a Martin Scorsese film could be? But I would let him do it. I feel bad that I was judging J.K. Simmons so <laughs> deeply now. But anyway, that's a revelation for me. I'll yeah. be honest with you. That's a real revelation for me. And, and so, and it's one of those things where he's he's bringing, he's bringing the Miles Teller character, Andrew is his name, he's bringing Andrew up to a, a level that he might not have understood that he could handle. You know, and... And he does it in possibly the worst way ever. Possibly? <laughs> no, he does it. In he the, does it in the worst way ever. He's the worst guy I've seen in film in yeah. forever. But, but then there's, I mean, before we get into spoilers, because I do want to talk about the end of the movie, I do want to talk about the editing. This is possibly the best edited movie I've seen in years. I love the... Uh, speaking of the ending, when they would go from the up close shots to, oh, to yeah. the out on, on the stage shots, yeah, yeah, that's, I know, yeah, that's it, jazz t- porn right there. Absolutely, I mean, that's is. a good way to put it. It is. It's because de- I mean, just just seeing there's very you know very macro close ups of the trombone slides going back and forth or the you know uh, finger pads on the on the saxophones as they're playing, and so yeah, that that's amazing. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about. The whole movie, and I'll I'll pick a particular scene, the very first scene uh, with him and his dad. Yeah. Before he even gets into the movie theater, you see him getting popcorn. Yeah. And you see the person who's giving him the popcorn, uh, you know, put it on the counter and then he pays for it. And then all of a sudden, you see a straight on shot of the person who's giving him the popcorn, who is... Melissa. Oh, no. Watch her <laughs> become this, this huge star and we can't remember her name, but good. Uh, ben- Benoist. I don't know how to say her last name. It's B-E-N-O-I-S-T. Benoist. But anyway, who's Melissa Benoist? Keep you saying see- it wrong there, Josh. <laughs> Benoist. <laughs> Benoist. Let's go there. <laughs> uh, Benoist would be an O-I-T. So, yeah, I You're know. asking me? That's right. Come on now. So, so you see a, a straight on, like a locked off camera you do not see shots like this in movies unless it's a Wes Anderson movie. Right. And you see a shot of her right on, straight on. And right there I knew this is an important character in the movie. I didn't know that that was the love interest the or anything ingenue, like that. Yeah. Didn't know that. But just that choice, that choice of that shot and how it was in her cut. And then he moves into the, into the movie theater, sits down with his dad. And then what happens? He, I don't know if you... I definitely noticed it the first time, and I and I locked it in the second time. Somebody walks behind Paul Reiser and bumps into and him. Bumps him, yeah. with the popcorn. Yeah, and Paul Reiser says, "I'm sorry." Yeah, and that is a character moment for that. Absolutely for the for his father. Absolutely. I mean, he's the exact opposite of J.K. Simmons, who we've already seen. Right. J.K. Simmons would have taken a drumstick out of his pocket and jabbed it in that person's eye yeah i mean it it is the exact he wouldn't ever put him himself himself in the position to being even hit to begin with that's right yeah yeah so, he would have seen the guy coming and stood up and been like what yeah exactly yeah. so you're seeing that juxtaposition number one and then number two the, the next thing that you see right after that is he puts the raisinets he buys raisinets puts them into the popcorn and then the dad says you know are you gonna have some raisinets and he says no i don't i don't like them I just eat around them. So you've got these two kind of like sad sack guys, a father and a son, and 
the son doesn't even want to tell the dad that he doesn't like raisinets. Which is obviously a tradition that they've been doing since they've been going to the movies. Exactly. You could say you could tell it's a habit. Yeah, and then and he doesn't even want to tell his dad he doesn't like raisinets because he's just I don't yeah. know he doesn't want to stand up for himself or something. And then the dad doesn't want to stand up for himself against the guy who's banging him in the head with a popcorn yeah. bowl. And so that sets the scene right there. And all of this we're talking about, this happens in 30 seconds. You meet the you meet the girl. Yeah. You meet the dad. The dad's established, the kids established, and that's 30 seconds. I mean, and, I don't and know you're how saying you could have all done of it. that is the editing, the way that that's put together tells you all. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's been I mean, that could have started off with 10 pages of dialogue to establish all of those things. And it got whittled down to 30 seconds. I'll bet you it's on page like that. And it could very well be. Yeah. I don't know. But things but, that are that well done are yeah. usually so well thought. Who knows? It could have been clipped down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could have been. But what I'm saying is that like it could have taken and there's movies that take much longer to establish characters. And this movie did it, it that quickly. Yeah. And so that I was just I'm I'm in awe at stuff like that. How you can dissect those things. Another scene uh that we could talk about is the dinner table scene. The best scene in the movie. Really? Okay. For me. Yeah, hands down wow. for me. Because you don't often see the one up. You know, guys have this way of going, you know, I've got this can of beer. And another guy goes, well, mine's three inches wider. I've got this can of beer and it's brown. And this guy goes, I got, everybody's always trying to one up them. I've got the biggest can of beer, whatever it may be. You're drinking a beer that's making me think of beer. That's what that's coming from people. It's not just coming out of nowhere. Um, You know, or I got the new iPhone and it has this app to it, but I got the new iPhone and it has these two. Everybody, guys especially, are trying to one up. Mm -hmm. It's the best one up scene I've ever seen in a movie. (laughs) And you heard me cackle out loud. Like, I loved it. I Mm -hmm. loved his response. I loved the way he handled it because it's a cliche. First of all, explain the family to me, though. It's Paul Reiser's. So it's his brother. So Paul Reiser has a brother. Reiser, His brother and wife. Okay. And their two sons. And their two kids. And it's just a Thanksgiving meal, I think. And then Miles Teller, who is Paul Reiser's Reiser's son. son. Okay. So those two jock guys are, and I use that specifically like that. I say jock guys on purpose. That's their character. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, they're his cousins then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then they get into a conversation about all their accomplishments and they're like beating their chest. They're so proud of themselves that everybody's so proud of them. And even Paul Reiser is like, that's fantastic. And then they ask Miles Teller how his life is going and pretty much they don't get how important what's happening to him is ha- you know, yeah. he d- they don't get that he's going to this conservatory, well, in, which is hard as hell to get into. Yeah, they're not they don't, in that world. Yeah, yeah they, but see, I don't understand that. My parents, my father was in the military. My brother was in the military. When they accomplished something, I was like, whoa, I don't fully understand this, mm-hmm. but wow. You know, when my brother um, retired from uh, the Air Force at the Pentagon, which you have to be asked to do, mm-hmm. you just don't get to do that. They listed all these accomplishments, and I was like, oh my God. I mean, I knew he was accomplished, but I've been proud of him just because he could stay in the military for as long as he did. Mm -hmm. So the fact that nobody gets him is a character choice, too. And the aunt is trying to be sweet about it, and the uncle's being receptive. But When he said you reacted very quickly to a a line where he said, he said, oh, so you're doing good in your jazz thing? I'm glad you got that figured out. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, oh, I know that guy. I was like, that guy... That's a mashed potato spoonful in the face, guy. You know, you just, you're like, really? You don't know me yet? How do you not know this is important to me? Mm -hmm. And so without telling too much about the scene, the two football players, jock guys, give him a hard time and he puts them in his... He pushes back. Yeah. For the first time ever, I'm sure. But in just the right way. It wasn't, he didn't get defensive. He didn't become over the top. He pretty much just factualized this is what you've accomplished. You have no idea what I'm trying to achieve here or where the bar I have set. You've mm-hmm. set this bar and you've achieved below it. And the bar that you set wasn't high to begin with. Yeah. And he just puts them in their place. And it's it could have been overplayed and it could have been this obnoxious moment for, it could have been a snotty artistic moment where the artist is like, I'm better than you are because I'm being creative. Mm-hmm. It's not that at all. It's a simple, I'm a guy, you're a guy, you're trying to one-up me. You don't. You're not even. You're not even at one. You're even close. You're like at negative ten. Yeah. I'm at one and been there for a while. So yeah, I think for me this best scene of the movie because it mm-hmm. was so 
maybe it's because you know that rings true for me because I'm mm-hmm. the artist and not the sports guy, and you know those kind of people might have picked on me at some point in my life. I'm just saying might have, um, and maybe it's kind of this great. Um, uh, affirmation that you have to stick to your guns because it's important. If you don't get what I'm doing, I don't really care because I know it's important. But if you're going to knock on me, Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure you understand not only what I'm doing is great and Mm -hmm. important, but what you're doing is not half as much as what you think it is. So anyway, so for that reason, I thought it was the best scene in the movie. Definitely. Um, And then the, the last scene I wanted to specifically talk about before we get into any kind of spoilers is the pizza scene where he has pizza with his girlfriend, which is the first time we've really actually seen them together. Um, and it's supposedly their first date, I guess. Yeah, it it's, is. Yeah, because... The timetable in this movie is very, like, compressed, I think. Um, yeah, no, it's their first date. It, it is their first date, but it's, there's a bunch of stuff that happens between him asking her out and... Right, because that. he gets his confidence up because he gets asked to be in part of this core band. And that's the thing that I noticed. Every time he interacts with her, he's something has happened in his in his musical life that has like brought him up a little bit. That's realistic, that don't you think? That, oh, of course it is. Yeah. It's great writing and and, it, and it's perfect, I but think. But don't you think that happens in real life? Like when we met each other, instantaneously I knew you understood on some kind of level the same communication about movies that I did. I'm mm-hmm. not saying it's better or worse than anybody else's. I'm just saying you don't meet ma- many people who can reference the things that we reference to each other immediately. Mm-hmm. And then when I mentioned the podcast to you, I was like, oh yeah, so meeting you was made me feel confident about what I know about movies and about what you knew. And then having the knowledge that I think I kind of know, and Mm -hmm. then knowing you had your knowledge made it easy for me to go, we should do a podcast. You know, I would have never thought about that before. But when you realize you're being true to yourself and you're accomplishing something, it is a lot easier to ask that girl out because, yeah, yeah, it's a lot easier to give those business cards out about our podcast because I think we're doing okay. So, you know, I'm confident in it on some kind of level. And so that makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. It's the date scene that is so awkward and so first date. And you know she plays it brilliantly, though. Oh, she, yeah. she, oh, she's something. Yeah, okay. She, she does. She plays it like a normal. I mean, you know, nineteen, twenty year old woman. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and, and and she brings up kind of like, kind of like reinforcing his previous demeanor. She brings up that he was always looking down oh, whenever yeah. he came in. Oh yeah. To the movie theater. And, and so, and then he talks about how his dad says that he's, you know, not very, I don't know, approachable or something like that. I mean, you know, and and so. Oh, he has to work on his eye contact. Work on his eye contact. Yeah, that's what his father says. Yeah. So, and then he, he of course runs into this kind of a roadblock already in the first, their first interaction together where she doesn't necessarily know what she's doing. She's 19 years old. So, I mean, I can understand somebody not necessarily knowing exactly where they want the rest of their life to go, you know, from an outsider standpoint. But for him, that doesn't jive. He doesn't understand that. He's like, wait a second, I'm going to be a drummer for the rest of my life. And how can you you not? Yeah, how can you not know? Yeah. Well, it's brilliant writing because you see the whole relationship begin, middle, and end all right there in that first conversation. You see it. You see them getting together, uh, becoming lovers, uh, friends, or friends, and then lovers, and then breaking up all in a matter of five or six sentences because you realize that he has a different focus than she has. She's just out having a piece of pizza with a guy she thinks is cute. That's Mm -hmm. it. He's over there going, so what do you want to do? And don't you know, I've got this jazz thing going on and blah, 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 blah. I mean, he's not that intense. He's very low-key about it, but you're right. He... He is like, what? You don't know what you want to do. He's like, I thought everybody had their whole life planned out like I did. Yeah. You know, that was his yeah, that, demeanor. Yeah. That's to represent that he has a singular focus on one thing, that first topic we brought up that I can't personally relate directly to. Mm-hmm. If and when I find that thing, I'll let you know. Or maybe I won't because I'll be so obsessed I won't have time to talk to anybody. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I think that interaction is uh, very well done. Yeah. Um, and then... I was just going to, well, we talked about that too. I'd say we, we can go into, oh, the lawyer in the, close to the end of the movie. There's, um, yeah. No. Yeah. I'm silently judging you. Yeah. Magnolia. So, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that to you in the movie, but I, I was going to do that too, yeah. but I didn't want to, I wanted to make sure you heard what yeah. was 
strangely yeah. enough, I've been seeing her recently in small oh, really? parts, and I like her. I like her tone of her voice. Her I, name's April Grace. I oh, wrote it down. Oh, I'm glad you wrote that down. I will never forget that name now, because I like her. I saw her in a couple other things just recently, and I was like, oh, I'm so happy she's still working, because she's fantastic in that scene with Tom Cruise. Oh, yeah. If it's not because of her, he would not have been as great in that scene. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's not seen Magnolia, when you see it, you'll know the scene we're talking about. She plays an interviewer. But yeah, she's the lawyer. And at first, I think I recognized her, but the tone of her, I like yep. the tone of her voice. She has a very interesting, she's a very, she sounds like a lawyer. She sounds like a journalist. Yeah. She sounds like a, a newscaster, but she sounds non judgmental when she speaks. But yeah, I did. I, I, I recognized who yeah, she was. That's what made me pay attention was her voice. And I was like, wait a second. April and then I looked Grace, at her. That one we can remember and, and pronounce. And pronounce. That's right. Well, I'd say we can talk about the the end now. I mean, I, uh, did you know that? J- Sorry. Did you want to say something? No, I was just reading through my notes and I wrote, I laughed at, I laughed more the second time cause I've seen it twice now. Right. Oh, I can. And, uh, what I say, I disconnected Yeah. because of that. And the, the, I said I was too wound up the first time. Yep. I mean, it was, I was shaking pretty much for a good portion of the movie. Maybe it was, there was a little cold in the theater, but at the same time, there was just tent. It was constant tension, you know. Even in the down times, whenever there were down times, I guess there was just constant building, building tension. And it doesn't, it doesn't really hurt or help, depending on how you look at it. That mm-hmm. you're constantly seeing a guy struggle with hitting a symbol a thousand million times a second over and over again to the point where he bleeds, and. Oh, it, it is intense, and he actually did bleed. Uh, Miles Miles Teller was is a drummer. Well, you ha- he he'd have to be the way that they filmed yeah. it. But does J.K. Simmons play the piano? Because it well, looked he like does he, in the movie, he looked like that he did. Was definitely him playing. the But piano. did you notice the second shot to that though? When he finishes the song, his hands are not being shown. Mm-mm. I I I, okay. I I register things like that right. because yeah I was see- purpose I, I paid attention the first time because I was like ooh it'll be interesting to see if he actually plays and I saw that and maybe I checked out after I was like yes he's playing there comes a shot of just okay. his face okay and, but you don't he's see not the, playing there. well I don't know if he is or not I mean okay. he looks like he is in the beginning of it so yeah. anyway but still I mean he he I'm sure he learned that that it, particular section of the song they gave uh, Natalie Portman a hard time because she didn't do the dancing in Black Swan and they asked her dance double do you mind that she won the Oscar and she goes she's the actress she only had to act like she was the dancer and she did, and that's why she won the Oscar. Yeah. They didn't. You don't need to be the dancer to be this part. You have to act like you are the dancer. Mm-hmm. And she convinced me, and I am a dancer. Mm-hmm. So there was no fault, or there was no discrepancy in the, you know, because they superimposed Natalie Portman's yeah. face, uh, computer generated Natalie Portman's face. So whether or not J.K. Simmons is playing or Miles Teller is playing, you surely are convinced mm-hmm. they are. Well, and Miles Teller was playing. I mean, he did get, because I was reading, he did, went through a whole boot camp of learning how to play. Did he play before this? He did play, but he played using uh, matched grip, what they call match grip, where you, you it's kind of like, you know, a little kid bangs on the drums. Yeah. That's like how you would hold Instead it. Instead of holding the Instead one like he did. Instead of holding one yeah. like, like a spoon when yeah. you're eating soup. Yeah. With your left hand, that's called traditional grip, where you hold with your left hand, you hold that, uh, hold the stick that way. So he had never played traditional. And so he had to learn to do that. And he did like, I don't know, hours and hours of practicing for multiple weeks just to learn to learn that particular grip and also to learn the particular sections of the songs that he was going to be on. Like it was, this is how crazy the editing was is that Damien Chazelle had to know exactly what scenes and what portions of which songs he was going to show Miles Teller playing the drums. Right. Full frame. So he could show, so he could learn to play those parts to look like accurately. He, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm sure they overdubbed on top of that. Oh, but, sure. But at the same time, I mean, when watching it and really scrutinizing it, it looked great. I mean, it was hard I to tell. Couldn't, I yeah. couldn't see. I mean, I saw more issues with the other drummers, the other actors that were drumming. Um, oh yeah, yeah, than yeah. Than with Miles Teller. See, I didn't because I don't really know that much, and I, I think I was only really paying attention to. I uh, yeah, I didn't really pay attention to those two other guys. I they obviously did a 
good enough job for me to not think, oh, they're not really doing that. Yeah, you know? but I think, you know, f- once I knew that Damon Chazelle was a drummer, I mean, you're in good hands because he's going to be the most critical of what he's seeing on sure. screen. It's not like you got some random guy directing a movie about a drummer who doesn't know anything about drumming. This guy was a drummer in a jazz jazz band. So. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, I mean, so so that that has to, to help and inform the, you know, the, the shooting in the movie. And then, uh, I mean, most of the band members were actual musicians, yeah, like the ones who sense. didn't have speaking parts. It makes sense. Uh, were, were the real musicians. Um, and the soundtrack, and I'm not talking about the songs. Right. The soundtrack. Yeah. Was, was written um, by, I've got his name in here. I've been listening to the soundtrack, Justin Hurwitz. So he did, he did uh, arrangements, and they, the soundtrack, or, or score, I guess, is cool in that it uses only pretty much the rhythm section of a jazz band and some horns and stuff but it's a lot of bass right and a lot of kind of like either bowed bass or just this kind of like plodding plucking why do you think he did that to keep it all in in this world yeah i think it's to give you the feeling of what a musician is feeling like when you're playing with other musicians and you can feel the drums and the bass i think more so than you could feel the the wind instruments the saxophones and sure. all you know all that other stuff it it kind of holds everything together i think mm-hmm. if you don't have a good drummer in your band you're done same thing i mean it's the same thing with the bass player too yeah i, I agree mean, yeah i agree 100 percent. i agree i agree mm-hmm. okay so let's get specifically to the end part yes so there'll be spoilers after now all right so uh, they play. <laughs> so there's like two. There's two switcheroos in this. Now, did you see the first one coming? Did you know that no, J.K. I, Simmons? I, no. Okay, J.K. Simmons um, gets fired from the, his job for being an abusive teacher uh, via something that. Um, what's Miles Teller's? Andrew. Ca- Andrew. I wanted to say Jackson for some reason, um, because he speaks with this lawyer and he grapples over whether or not he should tell on this guy you know he was doing everything for a purpose apparently jk simmons has a history of doing this to other people that set another student into motion to hurt himself and to possibly i guess he hung uh, himself he hung himself that's right i couldn't remember if he hung himself or how he committed suicide and so this lawyer wanted to take action they took action jk simmons gets fired you see none of this this is all you know told throughout a different kind of storytelling it's not this literal Mm -hmm. then later on you see that jk simmons character is playing at this local uh club uh miles tellish character walks by sees his name on the board goes in they Mm -hmm. meet up again they have a conversation they seem to kind of work it out that discussion made me think that they were square See, I should have known they weren't. And he got me. This is why J.K. Simmons is going to be an Oscar nominee. Mm -hmm. Because up to this point, I thought it was a great performance. But at that point, he convinced me, why should we have ever believed he was a nice guy on any level? (laughs) He never shows it. And the only time he ever shows it is to get something out of somebody. So Mm -hmm. for him to say to Andrew... Miles Miles Teller's character. Oh, okay. Well, I'm 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 okay with where I'm at. I know. I think it was so and so who told on me. That kind of stuff. Because that's an important part that he thinks somebody else told on him. Yeah. That he doesn't know that Miles Teller has anything to do with it. And then he says, "By the way, I'm putting together this, this uh, band." I think when he sees him in that crowd. He does it. No, I think brain. he's been thinking if I run into this guy oh. ever in my life again, okay. meaning J.K. Simmons running into Miles Tell, yeah. because that character is the most manipulative, <laughs> vicious, sadistic character I've ever seen on film mm-hmm. to this day. I think he saw him and he said, here's my opportunity. I'm going to play him again. Mm-hmm. And he convinces Miles Teller to come to this showcase that he's doing um, of this band, I guess the professionals, the professional bands. Yeah. That they're studio musicians. But they're playing all the same charts. So he's, he should be fine, which that's the other thing is that I guess he never went to any of the rehearsals, which is really weird. Well, but, some, I, I, or yeah. maybe it was rehearsals without rehearsing this particular first song well they established that in the beginning of the film when he can take over when miles teller can take over for the drummer because the dr- the drummer of the core band doesn't, doesn't have, have his music. music and miles teller goes i have it memorized so you can buy into that at the end of the film mm-hmm. that he can join this band and there won't be any issues sure. and then he joins the band and jk simmons 
baits and switches Brings it. Brings in Up Swingin', which is a song that he didn't know, had never heard, or never practiced. And Miles Teller. Oh, and it's very prominently said before they go on stage, have a good time, guys, but keep in mind, this is a New York crowd. They never forget. That's right. Let's have a good time, but be on your best. Well, and then he turns the knife before you even know he's turning the knife or saying... Where he's saying that, like, these are some of the best musicians in New York, which means they're some of the best musicians in the world. Right. And then we have crap drummer over here. Right. You know? Because he says, you know, he's, the, but I think the important part of that is they will never forget. Exactly. If you're great, they're going to remember forever how great you are. This is his whole career. Yeah. This, right there. This could make, because he stops being a drummer after he leaves school mm-hmm. and he kind of loses his passion. And then he redevelops his passion because he's asked to be part of this professional band to do, to do he this. He never sh- lost his passion. No, he. You could see that he was just like, he was working in this deli and he was just like, oh. No, he lost his passion. He put his drum set in the closet. He that put was it away. Probably a purposeful thing that takes because he saw how unhealthy he yeah. he assaulted another person. Yeah. Now he, I'm not saying it wasn't warranted, but <sighs> he he got into a wreck and then just just got up and I mean he wasn't even worried about the other person in the I mean the other person wreck was fine, but he wasn't worried about any of the things. Miles to do Teller with the gets wreck. into a car wreck and then actually. Well, if people are listening to this, they've already seen the movie. That's hopefully. true. That's true. That's true. So so anyway, he gets into the car wreck and just runs in, not even thinking twice, and and that right there is unhealthy. That whole situation was unhealthy. So he's probably prob. I'm guessing his dad's even informing him on this too, saying like, "This isn't good for you. You need to be away from this because it's gonna. Hurt. I mean." hurt you even more than it already has i think he lost his passion i think i think once he didn't once he realized that he was pushed to the point where he did exactly what his abuser was doing to him because he attacks jk simmons Mm -hmm. and not warranted and i wish it had been worse Mm -hmm. i wish he had been able to slap him a couple of times i would have felt a lot better Mm -hmm. i know that's terrible to say but i don't believe in an eye for an eye but it would have been nice for him to just punch him right in the face because he would have deserved it but Mm -hmm. he attacks him and he realizes that is at at that point that his artistry is not worth losing whatever part of humanity his soul is being sucked out of by giving over to that Mm -hmm. side of artistry so i think he just goes i'm done because i've i don't have it in me anymore Mm -hmm. to to feel this because look what it did to me i think it's a combination of both of what we're talking about okay so back to the or not the caravan upswing yeah yeah, so uh, jk simmons says okay well welcome to tonight's show blah 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 we're gonna start with a new song that and Miles Teller has no idea Freaks about out. this song. He knows nothing. He thinks he's going to do all of this stuff that they've um, rehearsed in, in Whiplash and Caravan, basically. When they were, when songs. he was in, when he was in the conservatory, when he was in the school, mm-hmm. and of course he fails and he flubs. And J.K. And it sounds horrible. It does sound really horrible. I thought that they could have made it a little bit better. I think he could have adjusted a little bit more. He did, and then, though, but the problem is that song has a lot of like stop times where. Where the whole you know horn section stops and it's a drum fill or okay. it's a bass bass solo and he's like playing over the bass solo yeah. or he's playing extra when he shouldn't or he's not doing a fill when he should you know and then J.K. Simmons and and it's beautifully shot it's probably the best um, up close shot that I've seen of J.K. Simmons ever in his career I mean his face every wrinkle <laughs> wrinkle every but it looks so textured like i i was envious of how charactered his face looked i thought wow this guy you know this is a really interesting looking guy so he walks over to miles teller in the middle of this show and says i know it was you who told on me that got me fired from the job ha ha do you basically. know how that was how that was lit there was a spotlight on andrew and he stood at, like in front of the spotlight, so you see light coming around his bald head, and like you see it kind of like spilling onto his cheeks and stuff. But you don't really. It's kind of like a a ma- It looked like a mask, like some sort of. It a sure did. Halloween mask or something. It sure did. But I was a tad bit envious that he had so much character in his face. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people worry about aging in this society. I actually think you get much more interesting looking. For me as an actor, I think you get way more interesting looking when you get um, J.K. Simmons' age and everything about the way he looked. And then I realized that whole shot is to set up to show you how. I don't even know if evil is the right word because that. 
that this is a kid he's talking to. The guy's 19 years old, and yeah. he set him up for a public humiliation, bi- the worst of any kind, because he takes yeah. his artistry and uses it to hu- humiliate him, and it was devastating. I was like, oh. when he's affecting everyone else on that stage too. Absolutely, but when the bass player's like, dude, what are you doing? Who cares? I mean, he's the bass player; he doesn't know the song. But when he realizes he's in, in that shot of the audience, mm-hmm. very silent shot. Oh, and nobody claps. The the no. song gets goes over, and of course he's. Start, he gets, keeps playing after the song gets cut off, and then nobody claps, and yeah. that's the worst. The worst. And then there's <laughs> silent clapping starts to happen a little when bit. When the lights of, come up. Yeah, when yeah. a little bit of uh, um, uh, uh, polite clapping mm-hmm. or polite applause. And then he ta- Miles Teller leaves in defeat. And J.K. Simmons is like, yeah, I got you. And he walks off, and that's when you see... That's, see, I was perfectly okay with that as an ending to the movie. Not, not, like a, not like a good ending, but like there to be some sort of other kind of a button or something, but not what comes right after Fascinating that. Fascinating that you said that, because I actually thought it would have been a more interesting film for me if they had ended it there. Mm-hmm. I probably would have been depressed for the rest of the night and I probably would be depressed to this moment thinking about it Mm -hmm. and I'm glad they went back and gave Miles Teller his moment but I thought it would have been for me personally I thought that would have been a a harder choice to make is to end it there you defeated you 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 didn't even how could you not have had the thought that this guy is going to sucker punch you again Mm -hmm. he's done it consistently throughout the existence between you two and as an audience me- member i felt sucker punch i was like huh, i didn't i didn't get that he was going to turn yeah well but when you think about it if it, it makes perfect sense it's symmetry because absolutely because miles teller after the the wreck the wreck he publicly humiliates jk simmons well he also gets him fired too he does but, that's but the why initial, this... i'm talking about mu- musically right from a mu- from a musicianship level he publicly publicly humiliate this is a these are these uh these uh, jazz competitions that they go to and just crush everybody and now all of a sudden his drummer's just not playing i mean of course they're not going to win that jazz comp- competition now right and so he's effectively publicly humiliating jk simmons and so he turns right around and does the but same he, thing but he jk simmons ruins miles teller's career Career. and life in parentheses because those type of people who are that obsessed their life is their career Mm -hmm. and vice versa so let's get to uh so is there anything else you wanted to talk about with Uh, the ending because yeah go ahead ahead. (laughs) well he hugs paul reiser and then paul reiser says let's go home right because that's what you expect and then he did the right thing as a a dad i think and, and being there for his son but then I was looking more specifically for like if there's something that flipped in like his brain and you see that on Miles Teller's face, but I didn't necessarily see that. Yeah, I didn't either. It but was, I don't think you need it because I think it's always been there. Exactly. And when that moment happens and you just know you're supposed to be, your feet are supposed to be at this part of the planet at this moment, you just know it. Mm-hmm. There doesn't need to be any kind of like revelation. Epiphany, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm gonna top him. I'm gonna go back out there and play. So he, he just, just turns right around, sits back down, and starts the song. And what makes it even better is J.K. Simmons' reaction. Of course, because see, and this is where I feel like, like from the beginning, where I was talking about how J.K. Simmons is doing this in somewhat of a selfless manner. He understands that he's never going to be one of the jazz greats. He knows that of his limitations J.K. as a J.K. Simmons, yes, you mean? Okay, yeah. As a, as a piano player and even as a, a jazz band leader, probably. So he knows that he has limitations. But what he says in, in his, when he talks with Miles Teller in the, in the bar, is that he's trying to elevate people to that level, uh, to be one of the jazz greats. And that's, that's his what he feels like his purpose in life is. So once Miles Teller goes back there after being publicly and professionally humiliated and sits back down and owns it and proves that he deserves to be there, that he deserves to sit at that, at that drum set and takes control of the band 
and leads the band and becomes that at least a glimpse of what a great musician can be, that's when J.K. Simmons reacts positively. And he reacts positively for the rest of the movie. Well, which is not that much longer. Exactly. But I think the reaction when he sees him sit back down at the drum set, it's the first time that Miles Teller has done anything that has surprised J.K. Simmons' character. I think J.K. Simmons can play him so well, meaning mm. play Miles T- Teller's character, because he knows he's one step ahead of everything. He, this isn't the first time he's done it. Yeah, exactly. So when he sees that kid come back and sit down, I think he's actually shocked. Oh, wait, I did not foresee this? Because I think he's manipulated the situation from day one. Once mm-hmm. he realized this, that Miles T- Teller got him fired, mm-hmm. I think he's been looking for that opportunity. It was handed to him by him showing up at that sure. jazz club that one night. But that's the only moment where you see any real vulnerability other than the scene where he finds out early on in the film his cry scene, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Th- that's the only vulnerability and the kind of true humanness that J.K. Simmons has is right there. He's like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. I thought, I, I think reaction-wise, it's the best reaction in the film. But anyway, so, he, so Miles so, yeah, Teller takes the drum he set. Takes, he starts going, and then you you start getting this symbiotic relationship between right. Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons. I'll lead you in, he says. That's, that's right. great. Where where they're they're getting together they're working together as a team to get through this chart the uh caravan which is a great tune i mean it's a difficult tune for a drummer and because it's just crazy fast when played at, at that tempo but uh so and then he goes through this extended drum solo where you know jk simmons is like whoa this is you know shocking too and he he starts to it starts to you know doubt I guess a little bit maybe but then he completely buys in and and Miles Teller allows J.K. Simmons to kind of like control conduct him and conduct him and they work together musically right um, and and that that is that is really exciting and then the very not well, the very last scene but um, right as he's building to his drum solo crescendo you get you get this he, he kind of like stop he builds it up and then stops and you see this this look and i've got it written down there's there's three looks i guess one the first look happens when when you have the um the dad when you have paul riser he there's a, a shot when he, when miles teller's doing he's doing the drum solo at the very end and Paul Reiser's face kind of goes from like being proud of his son for sticking up for himself and and for being, you know, being getting back out there and fighting. It goes from like a look of pride to a look of wonder. Like, yeah, because he sees the artist that this kid has been saying he is this whole entire time. He really didn't get it until exactly. right there. He, well, he almost a, goes ghost white. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with with uh he's like no this is just my little boy i saw him when he was a little kid and he was banging on drums when he was a kid and he goes from seeing him as a a a kid or as his son to seeing him as i mean as an amazing musician absolutely and that's a that's a great look and then the next look is miles teller putting it all out there showing everything he's got in this amazing solo and he's just completely drenched in sweat and he's he just he gets done and he's waiting for the cue from J.K. Simmons to hit the very last note where the whole band has the very last note and he's just completely drained emotionally and and it's a look of what it, a look of exhaustion and it he's just looking for approval i, I think he's looking for something that says like i you know this is this is me i'm i'm out there i'm putting everything out there and i'm and i i want to see that i want to see you recognize my potential and recognize that i'm going to be something and then jk simmons turns around 
and gives him that look. I mean, it's just the eyes too. The way they frame yeah, it, absolutely. It's just his eyes yeah. and like cheekbones. You know what I thought that look Miles Teller had was? Remember how we talked about the dead zone, where you, when you're focused and you're in the middle of a piece or a monologue, and the world shifts, where it's it's this weird reality switch. Where they do that in his solo too? By yes. the way, all all the audio yes. drops out, and it's like a. That's the dead zone, dude. Yeah. They represented it, and that when he came out of it, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Whoa, wait a second! What I I reached it." I mm-hmm. went into that, and everything that you've been doing and saying this whole entire time, J.K. Simmons said I couldn't do this, or you know I wasn't capable of, or you pushing me. He was I, pushing him towards yeah, that. It wasn't I told you so. It was I did it. I broke I, through. I went there, mm-hmm. and as an artist in my heart, I immediately went. I almost turned to you, went dead zone, because <laughs> that's it. It's represented right there in that silence, and then when you come out of it, mm-hmm. you're not sure where you're at. You don't know where you went. Remember I talked about um, Denzel Washington and Malcolm X. He did those speeches and then he would watch the playback and he was like, wait, I don't remember saying that wow. because you're so in that zone mm-hmm. that it it literally feels like the physical world shifts. Yet another over-the-top dramatic metaphysical sounding thing, but it, that's what it feels like. And he got it represented on film with that silence. So I was like, mm. whoa, that's it. I know that. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And then, and that's, I mean, and that's the end of the movie. I think that it's, it, you know, it ends on a high. And I, and the the big question well, I have about it ends where it's supposed to end. But the big question I have about it is, is the, is the relationship between these two characters beneficial, ultimately? Like, it, what what do you think that Andrew's life's gonna be like? I mean, is it gonna be kind of a singular? You know, I mean, is he? No, gonna... I think he'll become. Uh, I think he'll probably get picked up by some orchestra or some uh, studio. Um, he probably make his money as a studio musician. People, but he's gonna possibly be so focused that that his whole the rest of his life's gonna be. It's gonna be detrimental to the rest of his life. You know what I mean? And that so happens. Be it. That happens to what a about, lot of people. Absolutely. What What is that uh, John Malkovich movie? This is a strange uh, reference. Making Mr. Right, I think it's called, where he uh-huh. plays the android who looks like himself and himself, and the the himself as the scientist is so focused on getting into this outer space um, exploration that they they built this android who happens to look just like John Malkovich, and mm-hmm. it turns out to be that the android is more human like, and John Malkovich, the human, is much more an, uh, Andrew like. I mean. Android? Yes, thank you. Robot like. <laughs> uh-huh. That he has to go into deep space for uh, years on end. And he's okay with that because he's so focused on being the scientist that it doesn't matter what the human relationships are. Yeah. Some people are like that. I, I have no problem with that. I'm not like that. I have well, yeah, and see, I'm not either. thousands so, of different other interests that I want to I know. know about. And it's so it's hard for me because I see things like, I mean, even on the, on the jazz uh, subject, I mean, there's, you, Wynton Marsalis is, is a great jazz trumpet player. His father taught at my college. Ellis Marsalis? I saw him every day of my life for four years. What? He's the simple, m- nicest guy in the world. Oh, my god. I used gosh. to talk to him on a regular basis, yeah. What college? VCU, Virginia oh, Commonwealth. Yeah. He, he was up there? I thought, yeah. he, I thought they lived down in New Orleans, but maybe that was His just... father taught at VCU. Wow, that's yeah. so cool. Super nice guy. That's great. Well, Wynton Marsalis, his, he's had, I mean, I guess multiple women and, and kids all over the place. And, I mean, he's all, he's all over the place. He's a genius. But he's, it seems like it's possible that his personal life has suffered because of his dedication. You hear it all the time. Yeah. You hear it all the time. I think that because of what Miles Teller's character went through in the movie, he has seen the difference between what should be and what could be. Mm-hmm. You know, what should be was this singular focus on being the greatest drummer in his life, mm-hmm. for his life. Yeah. You know, maybe not the greatest drummer of all time, but for his life. Yeah. But he's seen the other side to it. He's seen, he because he has the line, what's the limit? That line's mm-hmm. not just about J.K. Simmons' teaching approach. It's also about what's the line of how much do you give yourself over? Look yeah. what happened at the end of Black Swan. Yeah, you give I, yourself over so much to perfection that you lose mm, completely. Yeah, but I think that he's, I think that he's more asking himself. 
he, not yeah. more. He's asking himself just as much. as Absolutely, he's asking JK that's what Simmons. I was just making a point of. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. and so he's still mulling that over, and I think that he's more willing to give himself fully in the way that J.K. Simmons is requesting. You know, you know what I mean. Like, don't think about anything else. Just drum. You know, get another box of band aids and another pitcher of ice water to dunk your hand, your bloody hand. That's in. really well done. And yeah. It was interesting that it was sideways. And how it completely filled the screen, the, the blood. Whole screen. Yeah, I was hoping it would. I was hoping they wouldn't cut it before it filled the whole screen, and yeah. that's exactly what happened. It was, it was really By cool. the way, you said basically a lot. I think I've said absolutely a lot to this show, so we're well, good. Basically, we're absolutely <laughs> almost done. <laughs> I want to say <laughs> one or two more things sure. about J.K. Simmons. Um, first of all, he just won the New York Film Critic Award, mm-hmm. and that, yeah, I text you, so it you begins. Did, yeah. um, he was, without a shadow of doubt, going to be nominated for the Oscar. He is the front runner at this point. Mm -hmm. It's his Oscar to lose. And I see it. um, There have been other roles that I have actually liked him more in. Mm -hmm. And it's not because he's an unlikable guy. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I really don't understand 100% what he's doing and why he's doing it. Because... I don't have that singular focus on things. So I guess he's one side of the equation and Miles Teller's the performer side of the equation. Mm -hmm. He's the teaching side and you have to go there and stay focused and whatever it takes, throwing a chair, slapping somebody, throwing a symbol, which he talks about that, Mm -hmm. you know, creates this brilliant person. I get that. And this performance has... No, okay, so hold on. I'm sorry. It doesn't create a brilliant person. It allows the brilliant person... It allows person. the brilliant person to rise to the level that they've always had the ability to rise to. That a symbol being thrown, a slap in the face, a chair, does not defeat you from... Because, yeah, I mean, one of the biggest lines is the two worst words in the English language oh. are good job. He said, if Joe Jones would have told Charlie Parker good job instead of throwing a symbol at him, Charlie Parker wouldn't have you know gone back and just you know, practiced, done, you know, practiced insanely to the point where he was able to get himself to that upper, that higher level. If there's no resistance, then you're never going to, I mean, you can't, you can't lift weights without weights. Yeah. You got to have something to push back. You're right. But I, I, my question for me, for myself is, is where's my limit in that? Yeah, exactly. Just like Miles Teller says. Mm -hmm. And I think some of it was to the extreme of, you know, symbol, okay, chair, okay, slap in the face for whatever reason. That was that, your line. Yeah, that's my line right there. It's it's <laughs> yeah. just I don't think that's okay on any level. But now that we've been talking Unless about it's Marty it, Scorsese. well, there's that too, man. There's that too. But now that we've been talking a lot about it, it 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 brings up something in me that I have to be honest and say I get that. I mean, I really do on both levels get mm-hmm. pushing somebody like that mm-hmm. and being pushed like that because. You know, when you're doing a monologue versus when you're in a play, you have somebody else who's talking with you, you know, that kind of stuff. When you're doing a monologue, it's, it's a different kind of focus. In a way, I like it better because it's all on you. But in a way, it's scarier because it's all on you. Like mm-hmm. if you you have nobody to feed you the line, if you forget your line, you have nobody to remember where what door you're supposed to come in, if you're supposed to, you know, you have it all on your own. But that actual obstacle because we've talked about that too and having an obstacle in a character um remember i told you the story about getting hit in the head with the beer can Mm -hmm. and that was one of the best rehearsals i had ever had because i was so worried about passing out the whole entire time i had to fight (laughs) against it so i get all that so i I, i'm kind of in denial that somebody like jk simmons is sort of not in the right but i see what he's doing will he win the oscar i have no idea but just the fact that he is finally at a point where people are going to put him into that category, he's been, there's a ton of performances he could have easily been nominated for in the past. I could name three or four right off the top of my head, but even Juno. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, he just never gets recognized. I think he's won a couple critic awards for some movies he's done, but this is, it's now his race to lose, which I'm happy for. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I just, I just want more people to see this movie. So if J.K. Simmons can get, on the red carpet for this movie and it makes people pay attention to this movie. I'm fine with it. The other thing that's good is that Miles Teller is now in uh, final uh, fantastic four. Yep. So 
that's people, gonna help yeah because we talked about him with that Zac Efron film uh, that um, roommate movie where oh Neighbors no 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 no, no, no. Okay. Uh, was uh, when we first met I just rented on Redbox uh, Zac Efron uh, uh, oh no yeah uh, that awkward moment yes exactly yeah. and I was like who is that guy I've seen him quite a few times mm-hmm. and he's also in um, the spectacular spectacular now yeah he's great in that and too. he was in the rabbit he was in rabbit hole he was a kid. He's the kid. Yeah. Oh, yes, he and is. And that's where Damien Chazelle said that he saw Miles Teller like a long, long time ago. And Interesting. And he was young then. Had his, then. Eye, had yeah, his he, eye on him. Oh, I then. didn't realize that was him. Yeah, he. It, it, I'm happy for him. They were talking about possible Oscar nominations and the fact that he is probably going to get overlooked because he's yeah. a little young and he's a little unknown for mm-hmm. for lack of a better term. But if he got a surprise Oscar nomination, it would have to be Best Actor because he's the lead in the movie. Yeah. And I, you know what? I would be all about it. I would be like, good for him because you know what? He deserves it. Mm-hmm. I, I doubt that will happen. I don't mm-hmm. think that he's going to pull enough attention away from J.K. Simmons. Mm-hmm. But here's another really quick point. Remember how we talked about fine line between Best Supporting and Actor? Mm-hmm. Um, my The way I categorize it is, is that if you can take the supporting character out of the movie and the main story still works, then that's the supporting character. Well, then, yeah, you can't yeah. do it with this one. Even though J.K. Simmons is the supporting character. But that would be the easiest way to get him uh, a nomination, wouldn't you think? Is keeping, it, keeping him as supporting actor? Oh, with that, well, he's a supporting, he's the supporting character because okay. it's not his story. Yeah, it's true. Miles Teller's story. He's there to support Miles Tell- Teller's story. Mm-hmm. But my point is, is that what defines a great supporting character role is that if you took it out, you might not notice it was there, but because they're so great in that role, it makes the movie that much better. So for that, yeah. it's without it. I mean, it's a tour de force. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I can't wait for. I mean, I've like I said, I've been listening to the soundtrack, uh, you know, constantly, and I can't wait for it to come out. On now I'm interested DVD. to see if it's going to get a film editing nomination. I would love for it to get a film yeah, editing. It deserves it's just it. Not as flashy. As Doesn't other, matter. As other, you know, you know, Interstellar is going to get an editing one. But you, you know, know what? Just, that those categories always see through all of that pomp and circumstance. I hope so. They always do. Uh, so it, it, I'm not saying it will. But yeah. it, it deserves it. And those films get recognized. Sometimes you're like, wait, oh man, that should have been nominated for film editing or sound mixing or all mm-hmm. these other categories that people don't pay attention to yeah. because they're not the big movie star roles. Mm-hmm. But these films do get recognized for that kind of stuff. Well, it does and, happen. And editing is one of those things where it's like, I understand you're not supposed to necessarily notice the editing, but sometimes it works out to where it's not... You're, you're, I'm not able to not notice it. Right, of course. And it's like the soundtrack or the, 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 the score. score yeah. yeah, and and it's it's a. I think it's great. I mean, I can't imagine it being being edited in any different way. You know what I mean? Like every, it's one of those like it's so it's so essential. I think the movie's only like hour and a half long. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's not long, but it, it's it's de- boiled down to its essentials, and it's yeah, it's perfect. It's yeah, it's forty hour and forty. Well, what we've often talked about is, does it serve the storytelling process? And Mm -hmm. the film editing doesn't bring you out of it. It actually, it makes you see that technique, but Mm -hmm. it serves the story because of those choppy cuts or because of the way he edits back and forth from the symbols to the sticks, to the feet, to whatever he's doing at the Mm -hmm. time, backstage, upstage, all that other stuff. It serves the story. You're getting a feeling from that editing. So those things get recognized. So don't be surprised. Let's hope so. All right. Well, uh, if you don't have anything else, I'm good. All right. Go see Whiplash. Yeah, there it is. Again. <laughs> Watch it again. Um, all right. Uh, if you want to check us out on the web, our website's actorandengineer.com. On Facebook, we're at Actor and Engineer. I guess it's facebook.com slash actor and engineer. Or you can just look up Actor and Engineer. And on Twitter, we're at Actor Engineer. All right. We'll see you next time. Until then. Bye. <laughs>